So, it is my great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce my friend and colleague, Scott Oser. Um, Scott uh, did his bachelor's at the Washington University in St. Louis, and then went to do his PhD at the University of Chicago, where I first met him many decades ago. Uh, as my kids would say, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, Scott and I shared an office in many ways, one of those big computers, um, and we even shared an infield on the softball team together. He was the uh, star pitcher for our uh, departmental softball team. Back then, Scott, when he wasn't playing softball, was doing gamma ray astrophysics, and eventually got his PhD in 2000. Um, he's had a very broad and interesting career, uh, having done neutrino physics, particle astrophysics, um, and has been on some of the most exciting um, experiments to date. Um, which uh, I'll talk to probably a little bit about in your intro. Um, he did his postdoc in Penn, um, and I'll let him tell you about that, uh, where they got had some good fun stuff, and he got to the University of British Columbia in 2003, where he's still a, uh, currently a professor of physics. He's received a large number of awards. Um, he's been a, a Canada research professor. He's been a co-winner of the Polanyi Award, am I saying that right? been a Sloan Fellow, he was a co-recipient of the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, and in 2016 he was just named a, uh, a Fellow of the American Physical Society. So Scott and I came together again um, to work on physics. Uh, he joined CDMS again in, in uh, 2012, and I just joined after that. Scott is a leader of the Trigger and the DAQ group, where we actually have a lot of fun and have been hanging out with our folks here. So today, he's not going to tell us about dark matter, but he's going to tell us about long baseline oscillation results from the uh, neutrino experiment. So please join me in welcoming Scott Oser. Thank you. When I received the invitation to come speak here, I thought to myself, I'll be damned if I'm going there to give a CMS seminar. <laughs> so, instead, I want to talk about an experiment I've been involved with since 2003, uh, okay. So I'll always start out by telling people why are you bothering. So uh, we'll be what we understand about the mixings and oscillations and we'll explain why that motivated the TK experiment and how it's put together. Um, we're still producing results. It's an ongoing experiment, so I'll show you some details of the analysis, uh, particularly the parts of it that I find most interesting and most alarming, which tend to be the same thing. And then close a little bit with future prospects. So, like every other fermion, neutrinos come in threes, and we define them, in fact, by what charged lepton they couple to in a, with a W. For example, an electron neutrino is defined, if you like, to be the neutrino that makes an electron when it hits a W. In fact, it's very natural to think that there's something like electronness or power, <coughs> for example, that the neutrino carries. And this is how, in fact, we discovered that there was more than one kind of neutrino to begin with. People created neutrinos from muon decay, and then noticed that when those neutrinos are detected later, it only ever made muons. And so it very naturally led to the concept of conservation of flavor, <coughs> which we now know is all crap. And the reason it's wrong is that we understand that there's actually an important distinction that was lost, which is that there, the flavor eigenstates um, are not identical to the mass eigenstate. So what if what we call a mu mu or a mu e is really a quantum superposition of two other states, we'll call them mu one and mu two, and we can relate them by a mixing angle, for example. So what I want you to think of is that mu one and mu two are two states with definite mass, and mu e, the state that's produced when a w decays into an electron and a neutrino, um, is this particular superposition, and the orthogonal superposition will be mu mu, and this is, of course, two by two you know, two generation version, we'll generalize to three generations in a second. If this seems confusing, well, it shouldn't be any more confusing than quarks. Quarks physics has been doing this for decades, and we don't think much about it. We all know that an up doesn't couple with down, it couples to something called down prime, which is actually a linear superposition of down, strange, and charm, related by CKM matrix. And the only thing that's different about neutrinos is that because, unlike quarks, which have both weak and strong, and if you like E and M, well, neutrinos only have the weak flavor, so we don't have another force probe to test them with. 
So we're not used to thinking about the mass in states if you like. But nonetheless, they can't, they, in principle, this mixing was allowed. Once again, it's a three by three unitary matrix. And once you allow that, it's a very short step to the idea of oscillation. If you make a new E, for example, at time zero, this particular superposition, and let's suppose this is made, um, a state that's made at a particular momentum. So you know the momentum. You stick in the usual quantum mechanical uh, phase operator, E to the I E T, H bar equals one. You substitute in momentum, the momentum energy relationship. And you observe that if the momenta are the same, but the masses are different, then you develop a relative phase difference between the two components. And that phase difference depends on the masses squared depends on time, which the neutrinos are always traveling very close to the speed of light, so it's basically a distance, right? And you, the probability that what started out as a new E will be detected as a new E oscillates with this very characteristic energy dependence. It depends on the differences in the masses squared, distance traveled, and one over energy. Why one over energy? Well, you could Taylor series expand this thing, but if you want, think of this as time dilation. Lawrence Boop's factor goes up, the oscillation decreases, right? And the mixing angle comes into play. And so if you plot this, the location of where you have the maximum oscillation, so the most neutrinos oscillating, you know, one is no oscillation. That location gives you the delta m squared, if you know L and A. And then the amount of disappearance is going to tell you the mixing angle. But we got to do this in three generations now. And it's traditional to factorize this mixing matrix into these three components here. You parameterize it by three mixing angles, theta 2, 3, so cosine and sine, respectively, theta 1, 3, theta 1, 2, and possibly a complex phase that provides CP violation. And the idea is if you do experiments at different values of L over E, distance over energy, you're sensitive to different delta m squared. So for example, here are oscillations driven by the second, splitting between the second and third mass states. Here's the first and the second. And different experimental setups will have sensitivity to different aspects of this matrix. And to first order, all of these numbers except the CP phase have been measured at least to one digit, um, which is pretty good given that 20 years ago, we didn't know any of this. What's interesting are the values of the numbers. 46 degrees, and you know, there's a plus three degree error on that maybe. Nine degrees, 33 degrees. And if you compare the CKM matrix, which has an identical parameterization among the many parameterizations that you can have for it, those mixing angles generally are all very small. The CKM matrix is close to diagonal. The neutrino mixing matrix is completely different and in fact, in this case, we call this maximal mixing in the sense that the off-diagonal and the on-diagonal elements are basically of identical size. The first conclusive evidence that any of this applied to our reality came from the super kamiokande experiment looking at atmospheric neutrinos. So these are neutrinos produced in <coughs> cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere. There's both muon and electron neutrinos that super K could be sensitive to. And what they noticed is when they looked at how many events they saw as a function of energy, so lower versus higher energy, versus flavor electron-like, versus muon-like, and as a function of angle, why angle? Neutrinos coming from right overhead travel 20 kilometers, the thickness of the atmosphere, to reach you. Neutrinos coming from the other side of the world travel through the length of the, the width of the Earth. So, Although we call this angle, it's really a proxy for distance. What you saw was that the electron neutrinos were more or less as expected. The muon neutrinos, many fewer were observed than were expected, and by an amount that was different. The ones coming from right above were all present. The ones coming across the width of the Earth were missing. And by amounts that differed in energy, was basically no way to explain this other than oscillation. Um, we believe that this oscillation of new mu to new tau. We're not seeing these extra missing neutrinos showing up over here as electron type. 
and the neutrinos were lower enough energy they couldn't produce taus in super K, so you, they would just be unobservable if they were turning into tau. Looking at another sector, in an experiment I was involved in, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, looked at solar neutrinos. And for years there had been this problem that not enough neutrinos were observed coming from the sun, but it turns out the problem is that the experiments were looking for electron neutrinos, which you can't blame them, the sun makes electron neutrinos. The only problem is by the time they reach Earth, they're no longer electron neutrinos. And Snow is the first to actually measure directly not only the electron flavor, but also the total flavor using a neutral current interaction, and showed that the electron type was only one third of the total of the solar neutrino flux, showing that there was a flavor change happening. The CanLand experiment looked at antineutrinos coming from nuclear reactors at an average distance of about 200 kilometers, and it saw an energy dependent disappearance of suppression that was well explained by oscillations, and you explain it in terms of a mixing angle and a delta M squared. Here's what CamLand preferred. Here's what Snow and the other solar neutrino experiments preferred. They obviously overlapped. Going more recently, another set of reactor experiments working at shorter distances, a distance of a kilometer, had sensitivity to what we call the theta-1-3 sector. So this is oscillations involving the first and third mass eigenstates. Um, and this is actually the full oscillation formula for electron and neutrino disappearance, anti-neutrinos, it turns out, for reactors. CamLand was measuring this factor at a long distance, big L. This value, theta 1, 3, is the smallest of the neutrino mixing angles. CamLand had no sensitivity to it because it was just too small. But if you go to a short distance, you can look for this effect. In Camlet, or for example, the Dia Bay experiment, well as we know and double show, have all now seen disappearance of neutrinos over about a kilometer distance. Um, it gives a mass splitting, which is consistent with what, for example, Super K saw in some of the long baselines. You see, and we're able to measure this theta 1, 3 value for the first time. So this started to come out in like 2012. What we don't know are the following. We know the mass splittings. We've got a larger splitting between the second and third state, and a smaller splitting between the first and the second. We call these the solar or the atmospheric neutrino splittings, depending on what kind of experiment they're sensitive to. One thing we don't know, however, we don't know the sign of the difference between the second and third states. You could have a scenario where you have two light neutrinos and a third heavier, and these are all relative terms. These are all very small splittings, right? Or you could have the reverse situation where the third state is a light one, and the other two are nearly degenerate at a somewhat higher uh, mass scale. Um, none of this, by the way, determines the absolute values. These are only differences. We also don't know anything really about the value of the CP violating phase and that mixing matrix, the complex phase. And that's an interesting question. If neutrinos respect CP symmetry, then the probability for a muon neutrino to turn into an electron neutrino should equal the probability for the antiparticles to do the same thing. And you can therefore form a CP asymmetry. You take the difference between these oscillation probabilities over the sum. You get some complicated mess that depends on basically every mixing parameter under the sun. It turns out we've now measured basically all of these parameters except the last one. All of these turn out to be of the right size that this could be in a large effect, and I'll show you how big it is in a moment. But what, why do you care? What, so neutrinos and antineutrinos might oscillate differently, so why? The hope is that this may have something to do with the uh, what's sometimes called the baryogenesis problem, or maybe it should be called the leptogenesis problem. Our universe is made of matter and not antimatter. The Big Bang should have produced equal amounts of each. Something had to produce an asymmetry to give more of one and the other. People have spent half a century trying to look for CP violation in the quark sector, in the B factories, and all collider experiments, etc. And there just isn't enough CP violation there. 
to explain the universe like we see. As soon as you have neutrinos mixing, you have another potential source of CP violation in the universe. So people were very quick, and early on in fact, to put together a leptogenesis scenario. Now it's usually kind of an indirect argument. The usual way people structure this is to say, well, Actually, what you should do is you should create a very heavy right-handed neutrino, so a, a, a neutral fermion, a lepton, maybe up at the gut scale in terms of mass, to decay asymmetrically in the particle versus antiparticle. And if you do that, you can create scenarios in which you can produce the original matter-antimatter asymmetry in the lepton sector of the universe, and then for various standard model processes convert that into a baryon asymmetry. So in that case, there's only an indirect relationship between the CP violation that we might see on our, on our oscillation experiment for what's going on here in the Earth universe. But that statement depends entirely on what the high energy completion theory is. There are other models, for example, that do this entirely with just direct neutrinos, in which case what you would measure off of an oscillation experiment would be exactly what's relevant for leptogenesis. So until someone tells me what the correct gut scale physics is, I can't directly tell you whether there's CP violations seen on Earth would explain the matter, antimatter, or symmetry in the universe or not. But it's important enough, you know, if we've spent 50 years as a community playing with CP violation in the quark sector, we at least ought to look to see what the leptons are doing, right? Does that story work better depending on one value of delta CP compared to another? If I'm allowed to cite model dependencies, then yes, yes it does. I mean, certainly, certainly, it, you know, there is a relationship between the delta CP phase and the leptogenesis, but then that relation, exact relation depends upon what the particle content is at the gut scale. Is there some value that would be small enough that we would say, okay, that's probably not it? That, probably not. I, don't, I, don't, I think that the theorists are too clever to let themselves be trapped by something as human as experimental data, right? Also, you have more parameters that you can Yes. That's right. There could be, even if we measured zero, you could still put CP violation yeah. in elsewhere because you have this increased particle content. So, let me explain the TDK experiment. Easiest to explain this with a map of the main island of Japan. Here's the Pacific Ocean, the East Coast. This is the J Park, the Japan Proton Accelerator Research Complex. Basically, a very powerful 30, 30 GeV proton synchrotron. Way over here on the other side is the Super Kamiokande water Cherenkov detector. And the idea is we're going to shoot a beam, which is going to be about 99% muon neutrino, the rest electron neutrino, across Japan. It's an off-axis beam, for reasons I'll explain. We stick some mirror detectors here, right at, near the accelerator, to measure the neutrino flux and spectrum, the point of production. We then compare to what we see at the far end. We've got a forward, before and after oscillation comparison. It's not entirely trivial to set a neutrino beam across Japan. You have to remember certain basic facts of um, geography, like the Earth is round. You're going to you just build straight, you'll miss. So you've got to aim your beam down a little bit so it'll pass through the Earth and come out the other side. It's a typical staged accelerator, you know, ion source, LINAC, you know, some of them call the RCS, main ring. We then extract the beam here with some fast extraction and kicking magnets into a beam pipe I'll show you here. The way you make a neutrino beam, well, it's hard to steer neutrinos because they have no charge. So what you do is you steer the charged particles that produce the neutrinos. Proton beam hits a this graphite target. This is about a meter long, that wide. Produces a whole spray of um, hadrons. Predominantly, we care about pi plus. 
we have some what we call magnetic horns, which are large uh, electromagnetic magnets with toroidal magnetic fields that basically focus this pion beam um, into a collimated beam pipe. Pions decay in flight along the beam pipe. It's 110 meters long. We make the muons and muon neutrinos. And we can, for example, measure the muon flux striking the end, etc. Here's a picture of one of these magnetic horns that produces the toroidal magnetic field that does the focusing. This is the beam pipe. You used to be able to walk down it, which I did once, but now it's too radioactive to do that. Of course, if we get bored with neutrinos, we can just flip the leads on the magnets and run them in opposite polarity to focus the antiparticles. So if you want an anti-neutrino beam, easily done. I mentioned the fact that we don't quite aim the beam right at our detectors. We use an off-axis technique where we actually move the beam to the side by about two and a half degrees. The reason we do that is something to do with pion kinematics. If you have a bunch of pions with different energies, and then they decay in flight, you know, here's the longitudinal versus the transverse momentum producing the decay. And you notice that all of these ellipses sort of pile up around here. And if you go off at one angle here, that corresponds to some off-axis angle. And so what happens is if you go, this is the energy spectrum of the neutrinos at zero degrees. If you go further off-axis, two degrees, two and a half, three, the energy drops. So you can tune the energy to what you want. The beam becomes much narrower. You can get something approximating a monoenergetic beam, which makes it the measurement easier to do. And you can align the beam at two and a half degrees, the green curve, it aligns just where we expect to see the maximum oscillation effect, given the mass plates that super are already observed. So what we can measure, first we can measure the disappearance of muon neutrinos. Our beam is 99% new mu, so they, those will disappear and you know, turn into other flavors. If they turn into taus, we new tau, we can't see them. They don't have enough energy to produce a tau. So what we will generally see is a disappearance effect. The first order depends on the mixing angle theta 2, 3, and this mass splitting delta m squared 3, 2. This disappearance effect is the same for neutrinos and antineutrinos. If they differ, that is not CP violation, that is CPT violation. I think we'd all be very surprised to see. <coughs> what the hell? We'll look. The other thing that is unique to TDK that hadn't ever been done before was to look for the appearance channel, mu mu appearing as a mu e. This has a dominant term that depends on theta 1, 3. It's about a 5% effect. Until the Diabe experiment, we, this was, in fact, could have been consistent with zero, but then Diabe showed that theta 1, 3 is not in fact zero. There are, however, corrections to this that depend on the CP violating phase delta. And these terms actually flip sign for antineutrinos. Delta flip sign, basically. And there's also some parameters here. X represents what we call a matter effect. Uh, it's an effect that I'll explain a little more about that affects the oscillation as it, because they're traveling through uh, matter, not antimatter. But the effect is something like this. If you have the black curve here is just the nu mu to nu e oscillation probability. Depending on the CP effect, if this, you have maximum CP effect, delta CP would be like 270 degrees then neutrinos would have an enhancement in their oscillation probability, and antineutrinos would be suppressed. And these are significant suppressions, you know, 20 to 30 percent effects. There's a little bit that also happens due to this matter effect, which I haven't properly explained yet. But the basic idea is you're going to measure these oscillation probabilities for both polarities and the So the matter effect is this. The Earth is made of electrons and not positrons. 
you could think of it as there being an effective index of refraction for the neutrinos as they travel in this matter potential. So it's different for mu e as opposed to mu u. So that alters the effective oscillation probabilities. So the probability for mu mu to turn into mu e as a correction factor compared to the vacuum value that rises linearly with energy you know, over some energy scale that depends on this mass plane. And that energy scales is about 11 GeV. It depends on whether you have normal or inverted hierarchy, whether it's positive or negative. So this is one way you can sort of determine which mass splitting you've got in normal or inverted hierarchies. It's also a little bit of an annoyance for people wanting to do CP because this effect also flips side. If it's an enhanced for neutrinos, it'll be suppressed for anti-neutrinos. So you have to be able to disentangle that. And partly you can do that by either determining the mass hierarchy by any other means you can, or taking advantage of a different energy dependence. Does this suggest that having a detector on the other side of the Earth would really help, or at least this piece? To do better at this, you want to go to wide, longer distances and higher energies. Okay. But, more, but more, more matter. More matter and higher energy, quote okay. The matter comes in through here, but you know, there's the electron density so okay. But really, the energy is the more important thing. If you go to longer ener higher energy, you need to go to a longer distance to get the oscillation, you know, L over E, right? So an LHC beam down to India? People talk about, we can talk about neutrino factories. That, okay, okay, sorry. You know. What makes this all hard rather than easy is that we very poorly understand how neutrinos interact with matter. There are four main detection channels that you need to worry about. The simplest is charge current quasi-elastic. Neutrino interacts with a nucleon to make a charged lepton. But you could also have various wrinkles. You could excite a nucleon into a delta resonance that then decays to make an extra pion in the final state. You could also do this coherently, where instead of scattering off of one nucleon, you scatter off the whole nucleus as a whole, sort of like the Mossbauer effect in neutrinos, if you like. Or you have deep and elastic scattering, particularly at higher energies, where you break the you know, nucleons into lots of partons and you start making jets of crap. What we care about for TDK is we want to measure this lepton. These cross sections, however, are not well measured. These curves for the different channels show you sort of the measurement uncertainty, how well they're known. And even in T decay energies, which are sort of around here, you know, we're talking 10% uncertainties in just the cross sections. We really want these quasi elastic interactions because we want to know the energy of the neutrino. And our beam is not mono energetic, it's, close, it's not it's narrow, but it's not all one energy. The oscillation depends on the energy, so we got to get the energy somehow. Quasi-elastics quasi are nice. It, you have a, a nucleon at rest, and it interacts with a neutrino, and you just get a lepton and a recoil nu nucleon coming out. You, kinematics are over constrained. You just measure the lepton, that tells you everything. So you can determine the energy of an initial neutrino as a, just from measuring the lepton's momentum and um, direction. And so you can reconstruct the energy, and it depends on you know, the energy of the, of the muon is produced, uh, um, the angle the muon moves relative to the beam, along with some corrections. You know, for example, the binding energy you have to worry about. The nucleon is not generally just a free nucleon, it's inside a nucleus. The fact that our targets are in nuclei where all hell breaks loose. Here's the problem. These nucleons are not just sitting there at rest waiting to be interacted with. They are moving inside a nucleus, perhaps coherently with other nu nu nucleons. And you need to understand that. So we use some a relatively simplistic model of what's happening inside the nucleus. We say that the first order, a nucleus, is a relativistic Fermi gas of nucleons. They have some Fermi energy and a binding energy. 
and you know, you figure these out for different nuclei. You can measure these at electron scattering experiments, for example. But in reality, is those nucleons actually are interacting in a common potential. You have to worry about that. And we use what we call the random phase approximation. Again, the scout developed in the electron scattering community to sort of model this. This is just sort of a correction to kind of account for these first order correlations in the momentum of the different nucleons here. And at some energies it suppresses the neutrino cross section, and others it enhances. But then life gets even worse. If you just wanted to model interactions of a neutrino with a nucleon, a proton or a neutron, what matters most is the axial form factor. It's usually modeled with what we call a dipole parameterization. It looks like this. It depends on one free parameter, which is m sub a, the axial mass. This has been measured with neutrino beams on a number of targets with drastically inconsistent results. Deuterium experiments give you values very close to one. The measurements on carbon targets give you values, depending on the experiment, 1.2, 1.3. It's not possible to consistently even extract something as basic as the neutrino cross-section of one nucleon from different nuclear targets. And this was a major puzzle for years, and I should say we still don't entirely understand it, but we have a better idea now. Just realize that there are actually some important multi-nucleon effects going on, where sometimes the neutrino comes in, instead of interacting with one nucleon, it interacts simultaneously with like a pair of nucleons that are in some coupled motion inside the nucleus. When that happens, what can happen is rather than kicking one nucleon out of the nucleus, which is what often would happen, you kick out both, completely changing the kinematics of the problem. So what you thought the neutrino energy was is not the real neutrino energy. And what you thought was a simple quasi-elastic interaction is not. So a lot of what we believe was going on here with these carbon experiments was that they were seeing these multi-nucleon events and mistaking them for quasi-elastic events. And if you can model this now, you can sort of bring these numbers into much closer agreement. But this is an ungodly mess. I have to say, I was incredibly naive. I watched as a graduate student my collided buddies working on their experiments, and they would show these jets. It just looked like an ungodly mess. They would say things like non-perturbative, QCD, pithy, blah, 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 blah. I think, God, no one can understand that. That's impossible. I, I'm going to go work on you know, weak interactions. Everything's simple. I can calculate weak cross-sections myself. I don't need any sticking event generator. Um, I then discovered much later that all the QCD physics I was scared of was still there. It was just hiding inside nuclei where you know, asymptotic freedom didn't apply and no one knows how to calculate anything. And people working in LHC collisions understand much better their QCD than I understand my QCD. Lesson learned. So let me explain what we do with this. Here's the Super K experiment or detector. It's a large water drum cup detector. The inner volume of mass inside our fiducial volume cuts like 22 and a half kilotons. It's got 11,000 inward looking photo tubes. The neutrino comes in, interacts, makes a charged lepton, produces Cherenkov light, and get a nice ring. If it's a muon, it's a nice crisp ring. If it's an electron, the electron will multi scatter. If it's very light, you get a smeared out ring. You can basically tell a flavor based upon how crisp the ring is. What we are looking for are electron neutrinos appearing in a muon neutrino beam. We need to know how many electron neutrinos there were to start with. So the intrinsic beam background. And we have to look for things that we will mistake for electron neutrinos, even though it was actually a muon neutrino, for example. Um, sometimes we'll produce a pion. If we don't detect the pion, OK. We still see the muon, but we'll get the energy wrong. Or we might produce a pi zero, which ideally will decay to make two gamma rays and we can see two rings. Sometimes we don't. Here's a simulated pi zero decay. Can you see the second ring? Here's one. 
computers swear to me that there's another ring kind of over here. And believe it or not, our reconstruction algorithms can find that ring and say that this is a high zero event. But it's not easy. Turns out we're actually pretty good at finding this hidden rings. We don't, we, when we built the experiment, we were very worried about these high zeros. It turns out they're not the problem. We're really more limited by just the intrinsic newly component of the beam. Nonetheless, we built a very fancy near detector for this. So this monster here is the old UA1 magnet. We got it out of, a, I guess, the CERN boneyard. Is that the right? Do they call it a boneyard at CERN? I don't even know. But it's a heck of a trip. Oh, yeah. It's, that was a fun. That was a lot of postage stamps to say that. <laughs> Inside. I'm going to focus predominantly on what we call the tracker. Three time projection chambers and fine grain detectors. And this provides the main tracking for this. We also have a pi zero detector, but I already told you pi zeros aren't really our problem. And we've got electromagnetic calorimeters surrounding everything. So this looks a lot more like a traditional collider experiment than a neutrino experiment. Let me tell you first about the fine grain detectors since I built them. These are one by one centimeter bars of simulator, extruded away from a hole down the middle for a wavelength shift in fiber. We read these out with these uh, multi-pixel photon counters, sometimes called a silicon photomultiplier. This whole thing's inside a magnetic field, so we can't use a regular photomultiplier. Um, we build these in the layers and glued in the X and Y directions, so we've got you know, measurements in both coordinates. And generally, these are the primary target in the near detector. It's most of the carbon, right? Each of these weighs about a ton. But we have this problem. We're very worried that the neutrino interactions depend on the target nucleus in a way we can't easily model. So for the second detector, I threw away half of these simulator modules and I replaced them by one inch thick polycarbonate panels like you build up a greenhouse out of. And we sealed the ends and we filled them with water. We actually circulate water through with the sub-atmospheric pressure system. And the idea is that if you compare this detector with the first fine grade detector that has only the simulator, you can do a subtraction and figure out what are the interactions on water. And that's what super is made of, right? The time projection chambers are actually the sexiest part of the detector. These are, these are big TPCs. So this is two by two meters by about 90 centimeters. Um, it's not super fine tracking. We only need about 10% momentum resolution of a GEV because the Fermi motion of the nucleons is already a thank you to the weak energy reconstruction at a certain that level. Um, we have Micromega's readout. Got three of these. They work really well. We started collecting data in 2010. So what's shown here on this side, the points give you the beam power steadily going up, and the blue curve is the accumulated number of protons on target. Um, you may remember there was a big earthquake in Japan that halted us here. This was just Jay Park being um, shoddy in their safety and getting shut down for a year. Never mind. Um, to date, we've collected basically equal amounts of data with neutrino mode and anti-neutrino mode. So the red points are neutrinos and the Purple points are anti neutrino data. In principle, you can predict the flux of super K. We know our beam power. We can model how many neutrinos we ought to produce in our beam. We know the cross sections to 10 ish percent from various other experiments. You could just take these together and predict the flux of super K, but you'd be off by 10 to 20 percent because these things are both uncertain at the 10 percent level. So we build this near detector. We make predict the flux of the near detector compared to our data. And basically, this allows us to tune our flux and our cross section. We get a constraint on the combination of flux and cross section. And because the near detector and the far detector are seeing the same flux and mostly the same cross sections, we can reduce the systematics quite a lot, as I'll show. You're going to get a prediction of super K. You're going to look at how we what events you saw at super K, and you're going to fit for your oscillation parameters. 
So let's talk about the beam flux prediction. Proton beam comes in. We can simulate the hadron production inside the target, but it's complicated. It's a big target. Particles can undergo multiple scattering, secondary interactions inside the target. We've got a model of pion and kaon propagation, full geometry of the beam line. We actually tune our model predictions. So there's a lot, there have been measurements of just hadron production measurements, like NA61 at CERN. They actually have run a TDK replica target and measured particles that come out. And so we use that to, you know, to tune our beam Monte Carlos. To, we can predict the fluxes of you know, muon neutrinos, muon antineutrinos, electron and neutrinos and antineutrinos, either the near detector or the far detector. But still, 10% level uncertainties. The near detector fit? Yeah, math. Let's explain the idea. We have priors. We have an idea of what the beam flux is with some uncertainty. We have an idea of what the cross sections are with 10 to 20% uncertainties. We're going to parameterize the flux and the cross sections. We're going to fit the neutrino data the near detector, and we get that much better constraints on that. It's a maximum likelihood fit, as you might guess, from the notation here. And because near the far detector see the same beam, you can apply constraints from one to the other. The events at the near detector, well, we've got we one of two FGDs, target one or target two, and the second one's the one with the water in it. We look for the highest momentum muon-like track in the event, we call that our lepton. We then cap, we figure out is it curving one way or the other, so that's going to give us the charge and the momentum. We count are there additional particles? Do we see any pions coming out? You know, sometimes you can reconstruct the pions directly and see the secondary tracks. Sometimes you just count. Oh, I saw a decay electron because there was a pion that I couldn't reconstruct, but it went a short distance. It stopped and became into a muon, which became an electron. You know, the new one lifetime or two later, I see the electron up here. We can do this for neutrinos and for anti-neutrinos. Here's, for example, the event distributions of the momentum of the muons for events where we see no pi on you know, one detector or the other. We're going to feed these distributions into our fit. We've got this parameterized flux model where we you know, basically calculate flux at every energy bit. We've got these cross-section parameters. What do I got? I got 23 parameters to per describe the cross-section model. Some of these are nuclear physics parameters like binding energies, parameters of the relativistic Fermi gas, these 2P2H, two-pole, two, you know, multi-nucleon correlation models. And, of course, we throw in our detector systematics. Let me show you what this looks like. The red curve here, this is the flux of neutrinos at our new detector. The red band here represents the uncertainty band. 1.0 is nominal. So that's our beam Monte Carlo. Roughly 10% uncertainties vary somewhat with energy. After we run the fit to the new detector data, here is our result. It is saying Hey, dummies, you got the flux wrong by about 10 to 15%. Boost it up, reduce the uncertainties down quite a lot. So, you know, this is shifted up, but it's, you know, it's not, you know, one signature kind of shift. Here's a whole bunch of cross section parameters whose name you probably can't read, and I can sort of read them if you give a damn, but you probably don't. Um, but once again, we have priors on almost all of these, and the data allows us to reduce from the red uncertainty to the blue to get much tighter constraints on these cross sections. And we also wind up producing anti-correlations. This is an anti-correlation matrix. The flux parameters are here, the cross section parameters are here, and they're anti-correlated with each other. Because what we're really measuring is flux convolved with cross section. So if you get the flux too high, you can make up for it by lowering the cross section by a corresponding amount. That's okay because that just allows you to cancel errors between them. That's why having a near detector constraint is a good thing. So here's how this worked. We did this first without the near detector. 
we could predict these things roughly to a 90% level principle. But we had a problem that there were additional cross-section uncertainties. <coughs> Basically, just because you know a cross-section on carbon doesn't mean you know it on oxygen. You go and you ask a theoretician, how well do you know that? And they throw up their hands. It becomes clear after a while that they don't really know. And they'll tell you 10%, which is suspiciously big and round. And so you write it down and you decide, damn, I better not use this. But nonetheless, in principle, our near detector allowed us to reduce all of these uncertainties to like the 3.5% level. But then we got a hit because we used a target made only of carbon. And so we were able to predict the rates at super K to 10 to 13 percent. All right, well, I didn't go through all that trouble to build a water target just to get limited by that. So just last year, we implemented the water target into our analysis in the near detector for the first time. We no longer have to measure oxygen or parameters on carbon and then just extrapolate to oxygen or directly measure it on oxygen. We're now predicting things at the 5 to 6 percent level at super K. So it took a long time for us to get the analysis mature enough to make advantage, take advantage of that detector, but it did the job. So this tells you also about the nuclear physics for carbon dioxide, right? In principle, yes. You could extract some things. However, the neutrino fluxes are also pretty uncertain at 10 percent level. And so I wouldn't rely on them at this stage to extract physics. I mean, we, you learn a little nuclear physics, but not... So the nuclear physics. guys are not interested in this? That's an interesting question. If we knew our neutrino energies better, they would be very interested in it. But because we don't have mono... It's not like electron scattering where you have a monoenergetic beam. We have non-monoenergetic beams, and it's hard to involve some of the stuff. Because you're all Texas? It's, it's, it's because... It's always, yeah. It's always. At any angle you can. It's because the neutrinos are produced by pion decay, which is a stochastic process, so there's nothing you can do about that at some level. What's happening at super K? Well, this is relatively simple compared to the nonsense that are here to tap in. We look for events, the beam is pulsed. We know when the event should appear at super K. We look within several microseconds at that time for the events, like it's sort of basically in the background. You make sure the event is contained inside the detector. It didn't happen just outside, for example. So it's an initial volume cut, two and three. Enough energy that it's a beam neutrino, and not like a coincident solar neutrino or something like that, or radioactivity. You look for events with a single ring. You classify that as electron-like or muon-like. You also look, are there any shell electrons that occur a few microseconds afterwards, which can signal the presence of pions. You look and see, do we see a second ring? Does this thing that looks like an electron actually, is it actually a pi zero? Once you've got them, you assume it's a quasi-elastic event. You reconstruct the energy from the momentum of the angle of the ring. So let me show you what the events look like. Muon neutrinos in um, neutrino mode. Blue curve is the predicted spectrum if neutrinos did not oscillate. Red is what, the black points are what we see and the red is the best fit oscillation. Nothing else, we tune the energy that's being just right. Those neutrinos are gone. It's not a monoenergetic beam, but it's still pretty narrow. And the oscillation effect is just blindingly obvious. Here's the same thing for anti-neutrinos. You can see how many events we observe if we you know, without oscillations and observed with oscillations. And this is, data is well fit by the oscillation model. We look at the electron neutrinos. So mu mu going to mu e. Blue is our background, red is the best fit signal. For the anti neutrinos, same thing. The background is a bit higher, signal is a bit lower. One thing is that you really lose on the anti-neutrinos for two reasons. The cross-sections are generally lower by about a factor of three for anti-neutrinos. And also you produce fewer anti-neutrinos at, at the target. We observe more events than we expect 
for the UE channel, no matter what value of delta CP, we're actually above all of them, by a little bit. Similarly, for the UE bar, we observe fewer events than we would have expected. I mean, we observe something above background, but not much. Fitting this all together, first let's fit for the oscillation parameters theta T3 and delta M squared. Um, lots of curves here, very busy. This black is the T to K result. We have favor maximal mixing, something close to sine squared theta of 0.5, or a little bit above it actually. We've got very narrow bands on delta M squared. Uh, our competition, NOVA, they actually are off to either side. They're not inconsistent exactly, but it's starting to feel a little bit of tension there. Here's the neutrino result in red and the anti-neutrino result in blue, as expected, entirely consistent, as CPT says. We actually have just a little bit of sensitivity to the mass hierarchy. I hard, can't see it from this plot, but we do a Bayesian analysis. We basically assume a flat prior. We certainly assume the two hierarchies are equal. Our data favors the, the normal hierarchy at 75%. And actually, the, the super K data prefers normal hierarchy as well. I, my guess is if you put all this data together, normal hierarchy is probably favored at 90% at this point. Well, where does that sensitivity come from? For, for yeah. us? Yeah. For, yeah. What? We have a little bit of sensitivity for two effects. There's an energy dependent, a modification of the ener oscillation energy that depend, uh, depends on the matter effect. And we also compare neutrino versus anti-neutrino, which, which the, whatever matter effect is there, flip sign. It's not a large effect. Um, NOVA should be more sensitive than we are to this, because they have higher energy and longer distance. But we have a little bit of sensitivity. Delta CP is the interesting one. Fitting for you know log likelihood versus delta CP, we have a best fit, which is basically minus pi over two. And if you plot this in terms of delta CP versus theta one three T to K curves of the black ones, um, we do it for both normal and inverted mass hierarchy due to this matter of fact issue I mentioned. This yellow band here is what the uh, reactor neutrinos favor. They have no sensitivity to delta CP, but they get theta 1, 3 with much better accuracy than we do. So you could actually include that as an additional constraint. Then you do the following. Just say, well, let me make a confidence interval on delta CP. You know, for normal inverted hierarchy, it's this yellow or black bands. Formally speaking, at the 90% confidence interval or limit, we do not include zero. That being said, I want you to be very cautious. And what drives this is the fact that we see a higher new E appearance rate than any of delta CP value would suggest, and a lower new E bar appearance rate than any would suggest. Put another way, our limit is noticeably better than our expected sensitivity here. So that probably means we got lucky or unlucky, depending on how you want to look at it. So I think the lesson you get out of this is that T to K says that they've seen CP violation and haven't been listening. I'm certainly going very far to say anything but that. I will at least say that this is the first meaningful plot anyone's that's ever produced that had sensitivity to delta CP. That's what's new about this. And it is true that the data such as it is favors a maximum CP effect. But, you know, don't bet your house on it. That being said, people get excited to say, oh, if it's really maximal effect, why were we going to shut this experiment off? So originally T to K was going to run roughly 8 times 10 to the 21 protons on target, which it's collected maybe 10 to 20 percent of that by now, I don't remember the exact number. People realize if you basically triple the data set, you might be able to get three sigma sensitivity to delta CP by the time you finish running. And this would get you there about the time that experiments like do or Hyper-K, for example, started to run. So there is a proposal on, uh, being put forward to J-Park to just keep running T to K. 
probably with a near detector upgrade as well. In fact, I want to talk about one possible upgrade. The thing that really makes this a hard game is, A, you don't know the neutrinos flux very accurately, and you don't know the cross-sections very accurately, and you're forced to measure a convolution as well. But it was pointed out that because the beam energy varies in a predictable way with the off-axis angle, we would build a near detector that spanned a whole range of off-axis angles. Imagine building a super K-like tank, just very tall. You can predict how this spectrum evolves as you go up and down the tank. And that would give additional information that would break the degeneracy. Basically, we would know the how the energy spectrum is supposed to evolve. You like use one energy to go one angle to normalize the predictions of the other angles. Um, and so there's a, something called a new prism. Prism, the idea is you know, you're taking a beam and you're splitting it versus angle, you like. And by take, you, if you build this, you may be able to basically determine with much better accuracy what the neutrino flux is at each energy. And then you could use that to understand the cross sections better because it's a chicken and egg problem. So you know one, you can't really figure the other very well. So this is mostly a uh, Canadian led effort, and there's a proposal being reviewed right now. Longer term, if you want to do CP violation right, the name of the game is statistics. You just need a much bigger mass and a higher intensity beam that you can manage it. Hyper K is the Japanese version of this. You build a large tank, roughly 10 times super K, and one neat angle on it is rather than just putting two tanks next to each other, it's hard to build one tank as big as you want. You build two tanks, but if you're going to build two tanks, it'd be better to take one of them and put it in Korea. Because then you've got one in Korea, one in Japan, and you can measure both the first and the second oscillation. And that actually would break further degeneracies. And, you know, once again, that's, you know, this is not yet funded. It's a proposal. And, you know, it'll probably be another couple of years before we can see whether this is really going to fly. Um, but that's the current, you know, flight there. So, coming up to the top of the hour, the key to K joint fits to four oscillation modes. New E, this is new new appearance, new new bar, new new bar, and new new bar disappearance. So, this is state of the art in terms of measuring what we call the atmospheric mixing parameters. We also had the world's first constraints on the CP phase. They suggest maximal CP violation, but, you know, there's, it's certainly no, not conclusive in any way. And plenty of reason to be skeptical of our sensitivity skills. But I think what makes this a really hard game, and what I try to give you a sense of, is what really makes this hard is we just don't understand how an intrinsic interacts with a nucleus. If I, if I can calculate that with you know, three times the uncertainty that people can calculate, you know, LHC, you know, jet physics or something, I'd be very happy. But this is going to be critical, whether it's hyper K or the US Dean proposal or whatever, until you understand this, it's going to be really hard to make this. And so when people ask, what the theoretical contribution do you need to improve the nuclear physics? The answer to me is, but neutrinos theorist is the last person I want to talk to. I want to talk to a person, a nuclear theorist who understands Lucio shell model calculations and get them working on this. Not the most exciting thing for most people, but this is what's actually needed. All right, well, thank you. Other questions, Scott? Yeah. Uh, the, the dominant systematics, neutron nucleus interaction, can that? Can something like uh, coherent nuclear scattering, which would actually can measure the nuclear form factors and in detail the uh, well, 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 This is elastic, right? This is elastic, right? Can elastic be Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't think so. Well, I mean, it's, first of all, these are all energy dependent issues. So if, I, if you did a measurement of coherent neutrino scattering at 1 GeV, I'd be very interested. It may learn something. You tell me you're going to measure coherent neutrino scatter, nucleus scattering at a few MeV, it is of absolutely no use to me. Yeah. Just an inert, though? 
Minerva helps significantly. Um, we do use Minerva inputs into our analysis. The difficulties are, again, Minerva doesn't know they're being flexed to more than 10%, so their uncertainty, uh, measurements are always uncertain at that level. Second, they measure the somewhat different energy spectrum than we do, so if the cross sections depend on energy, you have to apply a model of and, you know, We use them as much as we can, but there's real, ultimately no substitute for measuring on the right target in the right field. Uh, you said that uh, you know you showed the plot of uh, angle versus the neutrino energy, you know the, the off axis. The off axis, yeah. Okay. So my question is, if it's here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. See, so there those curves that are well known. Yes. Uh, could you not run the off axis like you don't move your detector, but run off axis and then say, two and a half degrees, two degrees, one and a half. With a limited, to a limited point, you can. And in principle, T2K built their beam line so that we could vary the off axis angle by maybe a half degree. But, you know, this is a long, narrow pipe, and we can't go very far off axis. So we couldn't build it three or four, to three and a half or four degrees, so we have a relatively limited range. It's also just practically very difficult to do. So it's actually much easier to build detectors or even even if you do consider movable detectors that uh, move an off axis. Other questions for Scott? All right, well, thank you.